Okay, how's that, Chad? Better? Okay. All right. Anyway, I meant to get some readers, but I didn't. But that's okay. Um, we're going to Matthew 23 to start with tonight. And this is a familiar passage. It's also kind of a long passage. Uh, but it will... Uh, kick off and uh, contain most of our uh, outline uh, for what we're going to do this evening. Uh, it's in Matthew 23, and in fact, we're going to start with uh, verse 1 and go almost to the end of the chapter, but not quite. Okay, we ready? Let's have a prayer and get started. Wyatt, would you stand where you are and really loud lead us in prayer? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to um, thank you for this evening, just allowing us all to come together right now and just to learn more about you. And uh, Lord, just help us to listen to Rob and uh, be interactive in class. Just help us to really take something from it. And, uh, Lord, please be with all those right now that need you, all the sick and all those that are just in the need of prayer, just please be with them and comfort them. Help us this evening to take something from this class and just be a devotional later. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Matthew 23, starting in verse 1, I'll be reading from the New American Standard. Then Jesus spoke to the crowds and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees, for some reason, my little device just bumped me back to Hebrews from class this morning. That's not fair. Sorry. The scribes and the Pharisees have seated themselves in the chair of Moses. Therefore, all that they tell you, do and observe, but do not do according to their deeds. For they say things and do not do them. They tie up heavy burdens and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are unwilling to move them with so much as a finger. But they do all their deeds to be noticed by men, for they broaden their phylacteries and lengthen the tassels of their garments. They love the place of honor at banquets and the chief seats in the synagogues and respectful greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by men. But do not be called rabbi, for one is your teacher and you are all brothers. Do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, he who is in heaven." Do not be called leaders, for one is your leader, that is Christ. But the greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself shall be humbled, and he whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you shut off the kingdom of heaven from people. For you do not enter in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you devour widows' houses. And for a pretense you make long prayers, therefore you will receive greater condemnation. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you travel around on sea and land to make one proselyte. And when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves." Woe to you, blind guides, who say, Whoever swears by the temple, that is nothing, but whoever swears by the gold of the temple is obligated. You fools and blind men, which is more important, the gold or the temple that sanctified the gold? And whoever swears by the altar, that is nothing, but whoever swears by the offering on it, he is obligated. You blind men, which is more important, the offering or or the altar that sanctifies the offering. Therefore, whoever swears by the altar swears both by the altar and by everything on it. And whoever swears by the temple swears both by the temple and by him who dwells within it. And whoever swears by heaven swears both by the throne of God and by him who sits upon it. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier provisions of the law. 
justice and mercy and faithfulness. But these are the things that you should have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside they are full of robbery and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and the dish so that the outside of it may become clean also. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful, but inside they are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. So you too outwardly appear righteous to men, but inwardly are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous and say, if we had been living in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partners with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. So you testify against yourselves that you are sons of those who murder the prophets. Fill up then the measure of the guilt of your fathers. You serpents, you brood of vipers, how will you escape the sentence of hell? That's some of the strongest language in the Bible. It is certainly some of the strongest language in the New Testament. And it is the harshest language, I think, that we hear Jesus speak, especially in such a prolonged passage. This condemnation that Jesus had was for the Pharisees. But who were they? Most people realize that they were a sect of the Jews, but where did they come from and what did they stand for? Pharisees were the biggest and the most influential sect in New Testament times. Their name comes from the Hebrew word parash, which means to separate. They originated in the period between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And their beginning is really a reaction against the outside influences which had come to bear upon Palestine. They wanted to remain separate or pure from any of the non-Jewish nations. Unlike the Sadducees, who adopted the Greek language and customs after the uh, conquests of Alexander the Great, they refused to mix or to mingle with their rulers. They modified the written law of God with a body of oral traditions which they considered to be absolutely binding. In essence, they built a wall around the law with tradition. They insisted on meticulous care in observing the Jewish laws of ceremonial cleanliness, fasting and prayer and tithing. Their pride in their holiness often caused them to be self-righteous, hypocritical, and vain. One scholar lists the following types of Pharisee. First of all, there was the shoulder Pharisee who paraded his good deeds around before men like a badge on his shoulder. Then there was the wait a little Pharisee who would ask somebody to wait for him while he performed a good deed. I just I try to imagine the context in which that takes place and the events of a meeting like that. Hey take wait 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 just a second. I'm going to do something awesome. Watch. Now, we expect that from a young child. I tell a story on Ben, since I never do. Uh, 
when uh, he was about three years old, Jared Dockery and I were having a visit in my office, and we were talking about something, and I told Jared this joke I heard. It was one of those Jeff Foxworthy redneck jokes. And the joke was, if you've had a direct relative die after saying, hey, watch this, you might be a redneck. That was the joke. Kind of funny. Ben was in the building somewhere, and he came tearing into the office. He said, Dad, Jared, watch this! He didn't have any idea what we were talking about. Pretty funny. We're, we're like, sit down. That's kind of how they were. Look at this. Watch me do this. Another category that uh, Kohler came up with was the blind Pharisee who would <laughs> bruise himself by walking into a wall because he shut his eyes to avoid coming in visual contact with anything that might be evil. And as he walked along, he'd run into something and he'd be bruised. And uh, that was a mark of great pride for him. There was the pestle Pharisee who walked around with his head hanging in order that he might not see temptation, and so he'd walk around like this. And there was the ever-reckoning Pharisee who was always counting his good deeds to see if his good deeds outweighed his failures. Jesus warned that we must take heed and beware the leaven of the Pharisees, Matthew 16 and verse 6. We must not repeat their failures. Let's talk about some of the leaven of the Pharisees, the mistakes of the Pharisees, which we need to avoid. First of all, they had the wrong attitude toward themselves. They were proud. They congratulated themselves on the awesome lives which they lived. They felt like they were the better than other people spiritually. They congratulated God because He was served by such superior people. God, you are so lucky to have me on your side. Uh, there's that uh, story that Jesus told in Luke 18, verses 10 through 14, about the Pharisee and the tax collector who went down to the temple to pray. And... Uh, the Pharisee said, I thank you, Lord, that you haven't made me uh, all of these things. We're told uh, by history that Pharisees were glad they weren't women. They were happy that uh, they were not sinners. But then the publican, the tax collector, said, God have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus asked the question, who went home justified? They had a problem with spiritual pride. Often we're guilty of having that kind of a distorted view uh, of ourselves today. We can easily get the idea that nobody else is quite as good as we are. And we have to be careful about this, especially as culture gets worse. Well, we look better and better. But sadly, we look better and better to ourselves. And that's something we must guard against. If we make ourselves the standard instead of realizing that Jesus is the standard and we all measure up against Jesus as the standard, not against each other, not against 
folks out in the world. To this attitude, Jesus said, but he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. Matthew 23, 11. Number two, they had the wrong attitude toward the lost. Uh, this was the inevitable result of their inflated idea about themselves. Uh, consequently, they despised the lost. The Pharisees had no contact with those they called publicans and sinners because they feared contamination. Instead of trying to save the lost, they sh shunned them. Instead of holding out a hand of hope, they turned their backs. They were spiritual isolationists when they should have been evangelists. They were hostile to others who were interested in the lost. Matthew chapter 9, verses 10 through 13, we find out specifically that's true of Jesus. Jesus sent his followers on the mission of seeking and saving the lost. That's what he came to do. And that's what he in the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 19, and 20, told his disciples. And that applies to you and to me. The fact that people are lost in sin places on us an obligation not to withdraw and an emphasis to go. We often betray a pharisaical attitude with regard to the lost. Can I say something that is really close to my heart? We quit having gospel meetings as such in the brotherhood. Okay. They don't work like they did. They don't draw crowds like they did. Okay. I get it. What have we replaced that with? What are we doing instead in this community? And if I'm missing something, please straighten me out. This isn't something that's a local problem. This is a problem all over the country in churches of Christ. We don't have those kinds of efforts anymore to speak of. And when we do have some kind of effort, it usually has some other focus. Hey, if we've been working with folks and we've been inviting them and we've been visiting them and they've started coming to church with us some and they started hearing what the Bible teaches some, as we plant and as we water, at some time, at some point, there needs to be a harvest vehicle brought in. Else, what's the planting and watering for? Let's, uh, let's think about that. It's important. The Pharisees weren't a bit interested in that. I know we're interested. What are we willing to hop up and do? Next, they had the wrong attitude toward the Scriptures. They felt they had the right to alter the Scriptures to suit their own preferences. Mark 7, 9 through 12, And he said to them, You reject the commandment of God 
that you may keep your own tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, who, uh, and, and who curses their father or mother, let them die the death. But you say, if a man shall say to his father or mother, it is korban, that is to say, a gift by whatever you might be profited by me, it shall be free. He shall be free. And yet, and you suffer him no more to do anything for his father or mother. In essence, Jesus says that the Pharisees had succeeded in negating the commandment of God by traditions which they had. That's, that's the point that he's making. They claim to be teachers of the law, and yet they actually denied one of the big ten. Honor your father and your mother. They insisted that a man had no obligation to his parents if his possessions were korban or devoted to God, pledged to God by a vow. Thus they were able to manipulate their traditions to justify their disobedience to the law vis-a-vis -vis mama and daddy. Many have the attitude that God's word can be more or less altered to suit their own tastes. Some do it with creeds or prayer books or confessions of faith. Some do it by majority vote. Some alter the Bible with church traditions. Some alter the Bible by the proclamations of a hierarchy in their church organization. And then lots of folks alter the Word of God simply by saying, I know what it says. But I don't like that very much. Surely that's not what God meant. Jesus taught that he that rejects me and doesn't receive my words has one that judges him. The word that I have spoken shall be the judge of him in the last day. That's important. We're going to be judged by what Jesus says. And there's no way around that. I was listening to, of all things, a political discussion the other day. And two people were discussing how do you interpret the Constitution of the United States. That's what their discussion was. Their positions are neither here nor there. It doesn't matter. Anyway, they basically got down to saying this. How do you interpret Shakespeare? How do you know what Romeo and Juliet's about? Well, the words. And not only the words, but what did the words mean when those words were used? That's kind of important, isn't it? Let's say that, uh, that we uh, have a statement about a cow. And it says that everybody ought to eat some cow once a month. You ought to eat some cow once a month. But then let's say we go forward 150 years and the language changes and the word cow has for some reason come to mean balloon. And somebody reads it and says, I should have a little balloon every... What? Once a month I ought to eat balloon? And somebody else points out, well... Cow used to mean something different, okay? You interpret it based on what the language meant then, right? It's dumb 
to try to understand Shakespeare with current meanings of words. Correct? Am I wrong there? That was the point they got to. And then I thought in my mind, how do we interpret the Word of God? The words. And the words as they were used when the Bible was written. And sometimes that involves going back and doing some Greek study. Usually we can find translations which are pretty accurate about this. But the point is, you know, by the words. Jesus says we're going to be judged by them. That's what he said. It's all important what those words are and what those words say. But the Pharisees twisted that around, don't you see? Furthermore, Jesus said they were hypocrites. And the word really means um, that they were actors. That's what the word originally uh, referred to. Uh, in fact, when we talk about Pharisees, we're usually talking about hypocrites, right? Sometimes sometimes we're just talking about people who take a conservative view toward frit Scripture. I've been called a Pharisee before. I've also been called a wild liberal before, so figure it out. I don't know. But... Sometimes people pull this out to call people conservative. But usually what we're thinking about is hypocrites. Only men played on the Greek stage. Consequently, they wore masks to portray their characters. And a hypocrite was somebody who wore a mask. And a Pharisee was not what he claimed to be. He was really something else. He was wearing a mask. Shakespeare said, I can easier teach 20 what were good to be done than to be one of the 20 to follow mine own teachings. The tragedy of the Pharisees is they simply weren't what they claimed to be. Well, I've rushed through all this. But I think we get a picture of the Pharisees there. And the point of the lesson is, don't be one. Be the opposite. Think about actions and way of life. And ask yourself, would a Pharisee do this? And if the answer is yes, don't do that then. To paraphrase Dwight Schrute. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Would an idiot do this? It is so. I do not do that thing. It's kind of cool to be able to speak.
All right, good evening. It's time for us to uh, start our devotional period here at Center Street. I think here in just a second we're going to have some young men that are going to be passing out some attendance cards. And once you've done that, uh, we ask that you please just put them in the receptacle on the back of the pew that's in front of you. And then uh, after services, we will come and collect those. A few things to go over uh, again uh, before we begin tonight and, and a couple new things. Uh, first off, um, a while back there were some parent surveys, I believe, that were handed out. Uh, I think I heard today that only one of those had been turned in, and I can't remember what the age group was for this. I think anyone that had children that were fifth grade and younger. Uh, but anyways, if you got one of those and you have not filled that out and turned it in, uh, please do so as soon as you can. Let's see, what else? Um, remember the student sponsorships for the Living Children's Academy and the Gambia. Again, the cost for this is $150, and it covers an entire year for them. And those are always much needed, so if uh, you've ever considered doing that, we would encourage you to do so. Also, remember that Rainbow School classes will begin this coming Tuesday, September 11th. There is a new morning start time of 9 o'clock. And if you have any questions concerning that, you can see Patsy Cohorn or Inola Rogers. As far as our prayers go, to keep in mind of this week, as always, there's a long list in our bulletin, but Polly Burke has been moved to a rehab center in Windsor, Connecticut. And if you would like to send her a, uh, a get well card or something like that, you can call the church office and get her address. Also, uh, please continue to pray for Ken Crudup. I believe uh, he's going tomorrow to talk to an orthopedic doctor to see what needs to be done. Also, Georgia Reading, we need to remember her in our prayers. Kenny Hemphill, Gail McWhorter at the uh, passing of her brother on Friday. And one that we did not mention this morning, uh, a former member here, Eddie Chapel. I'm sure a lot of you will remember him, uh, that he suddenly passed away. I don't have a lot of information about that. It was uh, Eddie and Kathy Chapel that used to attend here. Of course, he's the son-in-law of Randall Castleman. Uh, I believe that there is no visitation and that there's going to be just a private graveside service for him. Uh, but anyway, just remember his family in your prayers at this time. I'm sure that would be much appreciated. I think that was everything that I needed to mention. Is there anything else that we needed to announce? If not, leading in our service this evening, Dylan, I think, is that who you said? Okay, Dylan Holland will be leading our singing tonight. Rick McWhorter will be leading our first prayer. And Billy Davenport will be closing us out in prayer. So, Dylan. Good evening. If you'd like to mark the invitation song tonight, it will be number 714, 714. After you've marked that, please turn over to number 234, 234. We'll sing the first and last verse and then be with our opening prayer. I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day, still praying as I onward bound towards plant my feet on Let's pray together. 
Our Father, Father Henry, we thank you so much for the members here at Center Street. And Father, for the love that is shared and for the willingness for people to come and to learn more about you. And on this Sunday night, we pray that uh, what we're doing is acceptable in your sight. Uh, we pray that uh, uh, we'll get stronger and closer together by, by our study of your word. Father, we, uh, we know there are those in our number that are hurting. Uh, we ask you especially to be with uh, Ken Bruder, and as they meet with the uh, orthopedic doctor tomorrow, we'll pray that the plan of attack will take place so that he can be healed very soon. Father, we ask to be with the, uh, uh, the Chapel family and the Castle family. Uh, be with my wife as, as uh, uh, we're all dealing with uh, the loss of loved one. Father, we know that uh, uh, heaven is waiting for us. And Father, we pray that each one of us will live our life in such a way that you will be pleased with our efforts. Father, that you will recognize the fact that we're trying to do the very best we can uh, to be a good, strong Christian. And Father, help us to keep our eyes open to how we can help others uh, learn more about you. Father, be with the devotional thought tonight. We pray that as it's presented, that we will listen with open minds. And Father, help us to uh, go out this week and do the very best that we can to show others Christ living in us. We pray this in his name. Amen. Well, Ken wasn't well, able to be here uh, tonight, of course, and uh, Darren contacted me earlier in the week and asked if I would uh, fill in for Kenny tonight. I guess Darren's been at Blackout all day, so he hasn't had to bear the brunt of this, but uh, anyway, Joe Dell told me he took a nap this afternoon, so he was ready, but uh, this is the third time Joe Dell hanging in his mom. Our spiritual lives are not uh, pursued in a vacuum. Uh, our, our lives are part of a vast <laughs> spiritual realm, and not all of it is benevolent. There's open war. At stake are God's purposes in your life and through your life in the world. Most of us are familiar with Ephesians 6, 10 through 13. There the Apostle Paul writes, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and have you done everything to stand firm. And then comes the armor itself, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, feet fitted with the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and finally, in chapter 6, verse 17, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. It is that final piece of armor that stands out from the others. No matter what we can learn from the rest of this passage, we need to be continually reminded of one simple truth. We have only one offensive weapon at our disposal. Everything else is defensive. Just the sword, the Word of God, has been given to us for offense. And the Greek word used by Paul for sword referred to a fighting dagger, the kind that the Roman soldier would use in close, hand-to-hand -hand combat. Which is how it was used by Jesus. 
You recall how Jesus resisted Satan when he was tempted in the wilderness during a 40-day ordeal. Whatever the temptation, whatever the life, whatever the enticement, Jesus responded each and every time, beginning with three words. It is written. In the end, noting the unyielding power of Jesus' use of Scripture, Satan tried to use a terrible twisting of Scripture to tempt Jesus. Satan himself began by saying, It is written. And then he proceeded to quote a verse ripped terribly from its context that had nothing to do at all with what he was suggesting. And how did Jesus respond? To Satan's twisting of Scripture, Jesus rebuked him with the correct understanding of what Scripture really did say. The tense of the verb that Jesus used was an intensive perfect. Now, I wouldn't know what that means if I hadn't read it. But it's an interesting construction in the Greek language. This tense indicates, in this case, it is written, that what has been written in the past has an abiding, ongoing value. In other words, Jesus said that what has been written in the Scriptures remains written. They are an unchanging, constant guide to life and therefore speak to anyone or anything that challenges their truth. So have you ever wondered why the Bible is so frequently attacked? Why people are tempted to not read it, much less meditate on it, or even worse, apply it? Why Christians are tempted to twist it and water it down to make it more popular and less challenging? Why secular media are tempted to ridicule it and dismiss it as little more than the feeble, fallible musings from the distant, uneducated, pre-scientific, unsophisticated past. It's simple. It's because Satan knows it is our primary offensive weapon. He knows it from Ephesians, which we've already noted. But even more, he knows it from experience. He gave it his best shot, but it was Jesus who drew blood, so to speak. Satan knows firsthand how the scriptures are the dagger that can rip holes in his schemes, shred attacks, and pierce his lies. It's the one weapon that can cause him to flee. Because, you see, it's how Christians fight back. As the author of Hebrews writes, For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Hebrews 4.12 As Paul taught in Ephesians 6, it's a serious struggle we're in. We need to know our true enemy and put on the full armor of God, it would be foolish to enter battle unprepared. And while there's an old line that says you should never bring a knife to a gunfight, that might be true most of the time, unless that knife is the Word of God. This evening, have you let God's Word cut on you? Jesus wants to use it on you to make you what you ought to be. Like a surgeon might use a knife 
to repair a joint or to remove a cancer. or to cut a nerve that's causing a problem. Jesus wants to better you. He wants to fix you. And he can do that with his sword, the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. If you need to come, I want you to do it right now while we stand and while we sing. If you're not able to take uh, the Lord's Supper this morning, it has been left prepared um, in the chapel room. Uh, You're now dismissed to go there. Our closing song tonight will be number 841. 841. If the skies above you are gray, you are feeling so blue. If your cares and burdens seem great all the whole day through, there's a silver lining that shines in the heavenly land. Look by faith and see it, my friend, trust in his promises grand. Sing. You'll be happy today, press along to the goal. Trust in him who leadeth the way, he is keeping your soul. Let the world know where you belong, look to Jesus and pray. Lift your voice and praise him in song, sing and be happy today. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for another day you've given us to come to this building and uh, worship with our church family and uh, praising you, God, and thank you for Rob for all he does here and uh, the great message he's left us tonight and this morning. And uh, please uh, let us take his lessons and take it to heart and spread it through our everyday lives, Lord. And uh, let us be safe on our way home. And uh, in Jesus' name we all pray. Amen.